I do want to start here with the biggest story that's going on in the sports world, and that is the latest negotiations between MLB players and owners. And really the question is, are they any closer to a deal? Uh, I think it was last week or, or two weeks ago. If I, I apologize for not remembering. Um, I discussed why, you know, basically this is going to get as ugly as it, as it has gone so far, and you're going to have to choose a side, right? Obviously, we all assume and we all are on the same side of baseball coming back. None of us are rooting for the sport not to resume. None of us are rooting um, that these deals don't get done and that we don't see baseball in 2020 because that would be disastrous for the entire sport, and that will have ramifications for decades. I think not just years, decades going past. So they need to play baseball. And I keep coming back to that as really they have too much to lose. There's too much to lose for the owners. There's too much to lose for the players and the sport and the overall health of baseball, which is dwindling. The NBA is rising. The NFL is rising. MLB is dwindling and shrinking. They need this more than ever. So I keep resting on that thought at least that, okay, no matter what happens, no matter what we hear, um, no matter how mad the players are, no matter how, the, how mad the owners are, they both realize they can't have a 2020 season not played, especially because of money. So with that said, you know, you see the latest proposal that the owners put out there. And at first they rumored and threw out the notion that there was going to be a 50-50 revenue split between the owners and the players, something that does not happen in baseball. Every other sport, there's a revenue sharing where the players get a percentage of their revenues. Um, NBA is 50-50. NFL, they're working towards 50-50. They're at 47 and 47 and a half percent. I forget the exact um, new number with the CBA that, that was signed and ratified for this year. But baseball, that's not the case. The owners take the revenue for themselves. There's no salary cap in baseball. And really, whatever the players, whatever their salary is, that's what they get. So bonuses, they don't, you know, if the league has a good year, they don't see any of that. So now, instead of proposing that to where basically the players won't see and won't take share of the, uh, the earnings, they'll just take share of the losses, the owners then proposed on Tuesday, um, instead of that, they threw out the 50-50 revenue split, and they came with a sliding scale cut based on how much money you make. So, for example, if a player starts to make $35 million this year in a full 162 season, no pandemic, normal year, they're supposed to make $35 million. Well, the prorated salary, which they already agreed to, cut that in half is about, not great with math, I forget the exact number, but you prorate it down, you cut it in half, it's about, let's see, quick math, it's about 18 and change, or a little less, 17 and change. And now you cut that again the, with their um, sliding scale pay cuts, it would be about $7.85 million. So you have a player who's supposed to make 35, he's going to end up making, if they agree to the second pay cut, $7.85 million. Huge, huge haircut, Right. Um, and this applies to every single player. There's the scale. The more money you make, basically, the greater percentage that you're going to sacrifice. If you make the minimum, it's not going to be that much of a loss, but it's still a major loss. So if minimum wage, the minimum wage for a regular MLB season, $563,500. So just about half a million dollars, let's just say, to make, it, to make it easy. That'll go down to $262,000 if, um, if these players accept the, these um, these second rates. So obviously you cut that in half of the prorated salary and they lose about 10%. So anywhere between 10 and 70% to cut off the prorated salary is what the owners proposed in the latest negotiations. And the players are very, very, very upset. And apparently their counter argument from what I've been reading these last few hours is that they will counter with more games. So right now the proposal is 82 games. They want to counter with 100 games and guarantee their prorated salaries. And obviously... The more games that are played, the more money they make because their their deal and their hope is to make as much money or they're going to make money per game. 82 games, you're going to get basically half your salary. 100 games, obviously, you, you'll get more than that. And again, I've still been seeing a lot of social media accounts, a lot of people calling out the players, calling them greedy, siding with ownership in this, um, in this example. And it's, it's frustrating because you know what? Yes, we are not closer to, to a deal. That is absolutely not the case, unfortunately. Um, to answer my own question, it, it's getting tougher and tougher to believe that a deal is going to be done because guess what? You see the frustration that a lot of the players have um, with these latest proposals, and it seems like they're not going to back down. And here's why, at least, I think you should still, if you're going to get it on a side, why well, you should still back the owners in this argument and really double down and have their side. So I want to read you Max Scherzer's latest tweet. He tweeted this last night, and he is on the MLB executive subcommittee, eight players. So he is really, you know, in these negotiations, really out here trying to, uh, to help the players and get a deal done. He tweeted this last night, quote, After discussing the latest developments with the rest of the players, there's no reason to engage with MLB in any further compensation reductions. 
We had previously negotiated a pay cut in the version of appropriate salaries, and there's no justification to accept a second pay cut based upon the current information the union has received. I'm glad to hear other players voicing the same viewpoint and believe MLB's economic strategy would completely change if all documentation were to become public information. And there's a guy, so MLB, what they are trying to do here is essentially put the players against themselves. With this sliding scale pay cut that they're proposing, right, where the, the, most, the players making the most money will take the biggest haircut, will take the biggest loss um, of salary for this year, and the guys making the minimum salary would, again, it's about a 10% um, second pay cut is what they're, what they're proposing. They want the players to basically fight against each other because guess what they realized, and Kevin Pillar thankfully tweeted this out to add some clarity. Most of the players... Most of the major league baseball players are making a million dollars or less. They're not, there's not that many Bryce Harpers out there or Mike Trout or Max Scherzer who's making over $30 million a year. Kevin Pillar tweeted out, I think it's very important to understand this. He tweeted out 65% of major league ball players make $1 million or less. Now, why is that significant? Because those players that are making that little money are seeing the smallest cut. So if the majority of players are going to be receiving the smallest cut, wouldn't you think that they rally together, get together and say, you know what? All right, you know, our salary is going to cut in half. We agreed to that. So if I'm making the minimum, my salary is going to be, again, basically cut in half, and I'm only going to lose 10% more of what they're proposing. You know what? Fine. It's not the worst thing in the world. It's not the biggest cut. You know, I'll just accept it. Let's, get, let's play ball because guess what? You know, half of you know, what I'm supposed to make is still better than nothing. And a lot of these players aren't financially set long-term that a lot of these big-time stars are. Bryce Harper can afford to miss a season. Same with Mike Trout, same with Max Scherzer, same with Garrett Cole. These guys, God forbid, if we don't play baseball in 2020, they can go without the $36 million they're going to get this year or 35 or $30 million. They'll be okay. But a lot of these players aren't okay. Again, over half the league, 65%, are making a million dollars less. So the owners are banking on and hoping for the fact that the players and the majority of players that make little money are going to get upset of the, the minority of players that make a lot of money being upset about the proposal, getting another massive pay cut, and then basically have some infighting occur. That's their goal. They've wanted this the entire time. They've wanted infighting to occur as soon as they put the initial 50-50 revenue split proposal out there. They want players to publicly voice their frustration. Why do you think there's no owner? There's no general manager. There's no man. There, no one in the front office or in ownership has spoken on the record publicly since really these negotiations began. Why do you think that is? They see the players speaking out. They see the public backlash of the players being viewed as greedy and automatically siding with the owners because they aren't talking. But it's easy to forget. I want to bring to light, you know, bring light to this. It's easy to to forget. The owners, first of all, if if they're going to operate at a loss, which, again, everyone has been operating at a loss so far in 2020, right? There's no industry, for the most part, that's been unaffected. Unless, I guess, you, you, know, you have stock in Amazon. But outside of that, the owners have a great chance to make up the lost revenue this year in further years. And here's what I mean by that. So the average MLB career, five and a, basically five and a half years, right? 5.6 years is the average MLB career. Now, the average time, so the current, all 30 owners right now, the current uh, timeline of an ownership is 15 and a half years. So each owner has been in place for roughly 15 years, the average player career 5.6 years. Why this is important? Because revenues in baseball keep on going up. Last year, MLB raked in $10.7 billion in gross revenue. And why is that significant? That's his 17th consecutive season. Revenues continue to grow and surpass the year before. So owners at C. Baseball, despite the lack of viewership, despite, you know, they're struggling to kind of lack, uh, latch onto this younger generation of cord cutters, essentially, and essentially bring them in to where those fans, those millennial fans are going to the NBA and the NFL and not watching MLB. Despite all of that, they're still raking in millions and billions of dollars year after year. Again, 17 straight seasons of revenues growing is very impressive. And sure, they'll have a dip in 2020. But I don't see a reason why once things get back to normal, as close to normal as possible, once the economy recovers, once we're all back to working, unemployment has really significantly been cut down. Baseball revenues are still going to grow. And there's no reason to think that they're going to decrease at all. Television um, deals are starting to kick in in a few years. So more revenue is going to be pumped into the league. They will be making more money year after year after year after 2020. So guess what? 
They're going to be able to take a bath on 2020. They're going to be able to make up for the lost salary because guess what? They're in it for the long run. This is a long-term play here for the owners. Again, when, you're, when the average ownership currently is 15 and a half years, you can afford one down year. And make up small, you know, each, you know, uh, each year have revenues increase. You'll make up that lost season eventually. Players don't have that luxury. When your average lifespan in, in, uh, in Major League Baseball is five and a half years, basically what's going on right now is 20% of your peak earning potential is one season is this year. So why would you not try to get as much money as possible? Why would you allow owners who are already are billionaires, who already have tons of money, to basically pocket more of your revenue that instead of going to their salary, into your, I'm sorry, into your bank account, it's going to their bank account? I think we have to keep pushing and realizing the long-term gains here for the sport of baseball and for the owners are way more important than the short-term losses. The short-term losses affect the players more than it affects the owners. But the long-term gains from playing in 2020, from possibly being the only league to resume safely, right? NHL is going to try. NBA is going to try. There's no guarantee that they can pull it off safely. There's no guarantee they're even going to, to try to resume. Right? NBA has been talking. The NHL rolls out their player format. They still have a lot of negotiations to go in order to get players back on the ice, get practicing, and get a season resume. So theoretically, there's no guarantee that either of these sports can resume. And if baseball can resume and do it safely, they'll be the only sport on for a while. Those long-term games are going to go through the roof if baseball comes back, if they're the only sport back, and they really are the ones and the catalysts to kind of bring normality and normalcy back to, uh, back to our living rooms. And we will quickly forget the public fighting of the money. We will quickly forget which side took the sacrifice in the short term because guess what? The long-term gains are going to benefit the owners way more. And I'll say this too. Operating at a loss for one year isn't going to kill these owners. 29 of the 30 MLB teams right now are all valued over a billion dollars by Forbes. And the one that's not the Miami Marlins are at $980 million. So essentially, they're all close to or over a billion dollars uh, valuation by Forbes. So sure, no one wants to operate um, at a loss, right? Obviously, that's a big deal. Um, all you want to see is revenues keep going up. But operating at a loss in one shortened season isn't going to kill those owners. It's not going to ruin them. And more importantly, if they do operate at a loss, that means that they gave the players what they want, and that means that baseball will come back, and they actually, I think in the long run, will see more revenue and be a greater gain. And worst, let's go with the worst-case scenario. Let's say that this, this pandemic is really hurting an owner or two. Um, if this season does go on and they give the, the players prorated salary and they really can't afford to do so, sell the team. Your team is valued over a billion dollars. You will get a lot of that money back you lost in one year. So to me, this is all about the long-term play for the owners. They, they have to realize, and I think they do realize, that if they play the season, their long-term revenues are going to continue to increase, continue to grow, and they'll make up the lost money. The issue is they're tr still trying and they're still focused on getting as much money in the short term as possible instead of realizing, hey, the long-term gains are always going to be greater than the short term. Play for the long game. Ownership, you know, owners are here to, for the long game. They're not here for you know, four or five years like a player. The ownership lifespan is three times the amount of an average player career. And the revenues, again, 17 consecutive years have only continued to grow, only continued to increase. So they will see that money and they will make it up in the long run. So it's, to me, that's why it's, it's very important and why I'm siding with the, with the side of the players who are making the sacrifice, already have cut their salary in half, and the ones taking the risk, by the way, the ones going on the field, you can roll your eyes, you know, look at the numbers and tell me that, you know, 20 and 30 year olds are basically the safest of the population when it comes to the coronavirus. But we, can we, anyone guarantee that? Can anyone guarantee me that if you get sick, you won't pass away? We've seen folks in all different age groups get sick and unfortunately sometimes succumb to the virus. Not to mention, if you're at risk or if you have a wife, children, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles that are at risk. And you're still playing. You're exposing yourself every single day. You know, is taking two pay cuts worth putting your family's life and, and their health on the line? No. That's why it's imperative and important for me that the owners are the ones who take a short-term loss here and obviously re um, recognize the long-term games are way greater than short-term losses.